Hey there YouTube, welcome on back to Artichoke Dip, Solitaire Tabletop Gaming. And in this video, we're going to get into movement, scaling, all these questions with Solitaire Gaming that a lot of people get confused on, and some of these things that I use to help alleviate that and make it a more clear, concise idea of what you're dealing with. Now, a little disclaimer when we get into this video. There's a few things I want to talk about. If you have just found my channel and this is the first video you're watching, this may be a little confusing to you because this is a video series and I'm going to help you through this. So if you've just stumbled upon it, uh, you don't know much about tabletop RPGs and you know, you're interested in it and it's something you want to try to play with, then go back to the first video in this series. If you're a newbie and you just started out, you don't know where to start. I cover a few simple books that will give you a game. It'll help you uh, make a decision very inexpensively, I should say. They're about five bucks a piece that uh, you'll, make, you'll know right then and there if you like tabletop RPG gaming or if you don't. And then the second video, I move into more of a broader um, idea here, and that is using more elaborate game systems and other supplements and stuff like that to help expand your horizon. So if you're familiar with tabletop RPGs, you've played them, I would suggest you start at that video and move forward. If you um, are an experienced tabletop player, you've played in groups, whether online or in person, and now you're ready to branch out and you want to go it alone as a solitaire experience, I would recommend two things depending on your level. First one, if you are just strictly a player and you've always come to the table and your game master has had everything set up for you as far as maps and counters, stuff like that, stuff you don't have to worry about, you're just managing your character sheet and rolling dice, I would suggest starting at the campaign settings video and moving your way forward. If you are a seasoned player, you are aware of that and you have also DM'd and you also have that experience underneath your belt, I would recommend going to the game emulator and moving forward. Okay, with that out of the way, I get into the next part, which is with the video, if you guys like it, you like the perspective, you like what I'm showing here and what I'm about to go through, let me know. Click the like button. That lets me know you like the video content. It also helps with those algorithms and funnel more video content like that your way. And if you just found my channel and you like tabletop RPGs, well, don't forget to click that subscribe button followed by the bell icon. Every time I upload a new video, you're going to get a notification so you don't miss one. Or you can do option C, which is nothing, and just enjoy the video. So let's move on to this and let's get into some of the more broader concepts of RPG. So one of the things a lot of people struggle with with RPG games, tabletop RPG games. And this is movement, your character, the encounters moving through the world, how they interact with the world around them, how it affects your character, and all those game elements. Now, typically, for most people who play theater of the mind, um, you're really not going to deal with this. And for me, liking to have a more tactical element to my games I don't enjoy that way, and that's just me. That's just the way that I play. So if you're happy playing theater of the mind, um, you know, keep doing it. That's great. But if you're like me, you want more of a tactical type of advantage. You want more detail to your game. You want to know more. You want to be able to see more. Then I'm going to show you the way that I do it. So one of the more frustrating things about RPG games is movement. And just like I'm going to use Orcus, the Demon Prince here as an example, his move is an 18 
slash 24 flying. Okay, for most people, what the, what the hell does that mean? 18 slash 24. Well, this goes back to old wargaming concepts and that they still use today, which is all your all your playing pieces are going to be moved on the board using this. You're going to be using a ruler. And as you can see, that's an 18-inch ruler. And if he could move 12, he could move, Orcus could move from here to here while walking. But if he was flying, he would be able to move from here and we get to 18, and that's going to go beyond that 19, 20, 21, 23, 24. We're actually going to be further down here is where he can move flying. So pretty simple, right? And that's what that's breaking it down to is inch increments. And of all the plane surfaces that I use, whether it's grid like this, or you may be able to see right back here, hex I have underneath it, um, are broken up into one inch squares. So it takes that out of that. You already have your measurements laid out in front of you, and you can just simply take your mini and count your squares to represent the movement. If it's half movement, quarter movement, depending on the scenario your characters are faced with, or they have full movement, it's very simple to be able to navigate that. But now, different systems break things into feet. Let's use D&D as a good example. If you have a medium-sized character, that character can move 30 feet. So the way they break down their scaling system with a grid map is each grid equals a five foot square. So they can move five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, which is going to represent that. Other RPG systems you get into, some of them don't use feet, they go into meters. And it may say your character can move three meters. Okay, well, fair enough, that would mean we're gonna move from here to just about there. That's as far as they're going to meet that. Now, for simplicity for me, what I do with a lot of RPG systems, particularly if it comes to meters, stuff like that, is just do the conversion over into feet. And I just write that down on the character sheet. And basically it just simplifies things for me to, okay, he can move this many feet. So, you can see, I just gave you three different examples of how RPG systems will change up movement and perspective from feet to meters to inches. And how that can be confusing for a lot of people and how a visual representation can really, really help alleviate all that confusion. And this way you won't be so frustrated when you're trying to play a game solitaire. You can actually enjoy the game and allow these tools to be able to alleviate a lot of that off you. Okay, now when it comes to, as I explained in my campaign settings video, where we're going to look at the world map, we're going to have a visual reference, right, as to where everything is starting, to where, where what is what. You remember this, this is Donsmore right here. And then we explained about Tamarel, which is right here and the river and blah, blah, blah. I'm sure that all that makes, it's all coming back to you now. Okay, now think about it this way. And the reason why I like to use visual representation for my RPGs, particularly solitaire. Think if you're looking at a Google map, right? Donsmore looking at this perspective is going to be the satellite view. Now, when I wrote up all the parameters, basically, to give me a better idea of what to expect inside of Donsmore, it's now given me a little bit closer and given me far more detail. Now I know more about that area. Now I want to go down to a localized area, a particular point in time that my character has to resolve combat. Um, a trap. Perhaps he's trying to elude, um, uh, let's say, 
my thief has stolen something extremely valuable. The town's guard are after him. Now he's trying to elude the town's guard through the streets and get out of the city before he gets caught. All these different things that will come up in a solitaire RPG game and how to resolve them. You, like I said, you can use theater of the mind. There's nothing wrong with that. There has been many ways that I have done this and they have changed over the years to what I use now. The way I first started out doing this, and this is from third edition, this is before they started mass producing resin miniatures that are now flooding the market and I have just hundreds of these things. And that is, I used a map. I just put everything down, my localized map, and then I would just use dice to mark where everything was at on the board. And then to go a little bit further into depth, if my character went into this building right here, I could flip the map over and I had more detail on the inside as to what was what, what was where, and it gave me a visual representation to work off of, which makes it very simple for a solitaire player. I put all the needed information I needed in there. Like you can see here, I had doors, 1d6, and it would go through what they were, where they trapped, unlocked, locked but jammed, blocked from the inside, so on and so forth. So I had a lot of stuff worked into that. And there's nothing wrong with using paper and dice to um, keep track of who's where on your maps and what's going on. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a very simple way to do it. And you can take a whole lot of maps and fit them into a binder and put it on your shelf versus having a lot of large bulky terrain to figure out where to store. But, which is gonna bring me into when I get into this part of the video. These things I'm about to show you, you have to realize I did not accumulate these all at one time. You do not need these. I like to use these because um, I play a lot of miniature war games where I use miniatures. I like creating my own terrain whether it be out of foam, cardboard, what have you, it's for me a very relaxing hobby. It gives me time to work with my mind and my hands. And when I'm done, I have something cool I can reuse over and over and over again. And as you can see, it's just basically foam board right there, but I made it to look like a rocky outcropping. So there are different ways you can do this. Don't think you have to go and buy a Dwarven Forge or WizKids or anything like that. You don't. You really don't. Just be creative about it. And I'm going to show you why these help me with my solitaire tabletop gaming and how these simple implements may help you. Now, first thing is, I haven't deviated that far away from tile maps. As a matter of fact, I still use them to today. And... I like these now. Very simple, double-sided. You know, you can pick them up cheap. They're called Dungeon Craft. You have to cut them out yourself. You just get sheets of these things that come in a cardboard box. And you use what you want out of that. So, I do like these for my tabletop RPGs. So, I'm going to set this out here. Now, let's throw in a couple things. I rolled up my room. I know how big of an area I'm in, but it is, um, it does have a spell trap on it. And let's say it has another area leading out of the room. So those are the three things that I know. Okay, so as the example, this is, um, area is in some old ruins. So I'm going to use this to represent my old ruins. This is going to go here. Now I know exactly the entrance to where my characters are going to be coming into this room. So now with that, I have two other things to figure out. And this is how I leave this randomized for solitaire play. First things first. Okay, is the magical trap 
located by the front door. 50% will be my baseline on my D100. And I rolled 84%. Yes. So I'm going to place this here. So now I know that's magically trapped area right there. And now, can I see the area leading to off of this room from the doorway? That's my other question I want to know. Yes. So I can see from the doorway that there's a hallway that's leading out of the room and out of this area. We don't know what's going on in here yet. But let me see, I decided, let's say I rolled and it comes up with there's um, an area that's difficult to navigate to get through. So fair enough, I'm going to put some rocky outcropping here, which means this is going to be completely impassable and my characters will not be able to move through this area. And let's say the other thing is, is that there's some points of interest in here, like old bookshelf, like so, right there, so I'll put that right here okay now you can see a few simple randomized rolls now I have a visual representation of what I am dealing with here now this is going to alleviate a lot of things what does the spell do well let's say that spell is a um, hmm since I haven't thought of a spell let me see here. Let's go to our randomized tables. Let's pick, let's pick something. Okay. <laughs> okay all right so what i rolled up on the randomized table and what i mean by uh, you have to have a filter when you play solitaire and you have to look at things and sometimes you can't use things literally as they're written and you have to take the idea and be able to apply that to the current game session you were playing now, with this, I rolled on the random table, How to Deal with Your Nightmares, The Wizard's Guide to Nightmares by Victor Winding. This book will help young and aspiring wizards deal with their nightmares. It teaches different ways to get rid of nightmares and how to prevent them from coming back. Okay, well, let's say my characters aren't wizards. That book is not going to really offer much for them, unless they want to, they survive this and they can hopefully try to resell it. So what if I was to take this in a different perspective? Let's take this more so into um, a more modern source. And do you remember Ghostbusters? And do you remember they said, whatever you think of will materialize. So be careful what you think of. And you had the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man walking out in New York City. Okay. What if I was to apply that same idea, except for this, whatever their greatest fear is, when they walk into this area, they're gonna have to roll a save. If not, whatever the greatest fear is, will materialize into this room. And let's see, let's roll a save and let's say, okay, I'm gonna say the save is gonna be 70%. They gotta have 70% or better. Oh, they rolled a 07. They did absolutely horrible. They both failed. And as a result of that, the thing that has been chasing them and just plaguing their lives has now materialized around them. These little kobold guys. So now, 
that really helps put everything in perspective. It helps give you a visual representation, how close things are to you, so on and so forth. It alleviates a lot of that in using sources how I do Solitaire RPG. So, for me, I have found Scatter Terrain. And Scatter Terrain is really a cheap, viable way of going about doing this. You can get Scatter Terrain cheap. And rather than buying huge sets where, you know, if you're happy just doing dungeon crawls and that's all you want to do, buying a huge Dwarven Forge set and setting it up and running through it, maybe your bread and butter. But for me, I play a lot of different scenarios from dungeon dives to city to wilderness and wilderness being one of my favorite and the cool thing about wilderness is you can get trees very inexpensively now these are from the HeroScape set when i bought these at the time these were about 20 bucks now these are ridiculously expensive because they're out of print they no longer make them but don't feel as if you have to break the bank because you can always do something more simpler, like get railroad scenery trees like I did here and just super glue them to bases. And then these also will help with your scattered terrain as well. And if you're using a wilderness type of encounter, we'll say, let's say this area they're going through also has a river or stream, I'll say. It has a stream that runs through it. And this is out of this is more so out of my uh, Hero Quest set right here, Hero Scape. I'm sorry that I am using. So boom. Now I have a great visual reference here. I know I have a stream. And I can put more detail into my game for a solitary experience. Like, how deep is the stream? Okay, well, it's a stream, so it be, should be relatively shallow. But is it fast moving? Okay, well, let's figure that out. 50% being my baseline, I roll a 72. Yeah, it's a very fast moving stream. So chances are, if my characters try to cross it, they're going to have to roll a strength check to be able to cross this and and not be swept away into the current or they're going to have to be faced with another decision which is looking around this area and trying to find something to make a makeshift bridge to get over to the stream particularly if the adventure is in this direction or they could just follow the stream and hopefully this is going to uh, take them to an area that may have a already pre-built crossing like a bridge. You can see where I'm going with this and you can see how just utilizing a few basic simple things here, you can really um, give yourself a great visual representation. You can now alleviate all those questions of confusion you may have as far as movement when it comes to your RPG and utilizing that, you can simply look at the grids. Now, I have to say the most inexpensive way to go for gridded maps is to look into um, one of these sets. I can't even remember who made it, but... It came in, it had this great storage container, and when I bought it at the time, it broke down to their double-sided maps, 10 bucks a map, so that's five bucks each side, which is fairly inexpensive if you think about that. And it came with four maps, and it came in, it also has this cool carrying um, cylinder that keeps everything in it, but more so, it also doubles as storage to keep some of my older maps. Another way you can go about doing this, if 
which I have used for years. And I recently replaced it because the stitching is starting to come out at the end because this, this map has seen a lot of use over the years. And I was like, oh man, I really like it. And now they're, what once was 20 bucks is now way far more expensive. And you can see this thing has had some wear and tear and play on it. The stitching's coming out, it's starting to come apart. And I want to try to preserve this and save this for as long as I can. But these are another great little addition. Chessex makes these. They are a vinyl mat. They say you can use dry erase on them. I wouldn't really recommend it. The first one I had, I did that, and the dry erase never really came off. And eventually I got rid of the mat because you really couldn't see what the hell you were doing on it anymore because of all the previous dry erase that I put on there. And then it doubles out on the other side as a square hex, which makes things so much simpler, as I was saying, when it comes to movement, because now all of that work is done for you. You can just move and you know where your character is at, you know how movement works, time, space, all of those things that add into that. Okay, my friends, this right here is a really good way to alleviate that, alleviate that confusion of movement. Does the, does the monster have an opportunity of attack? Well, let me see. Your characters are currently engaged in battle here, we'll say, with the uh, this dude, right? Okay, fair enough, but they are unaware of these guys that are coming into the play area, right? Of your game, where your effect, your characters will be affected. Now you have an idea. You can say, okay, well, as these guys hear the commotion of the battle, and as they come in, as they creep around the wall, they can see that the characters' backs are to them. They're distracted, and they are easy pickings. Well, there's a lot of information contained in here, particularly if you're playing solitaire with this, that's going to answer. Okay, they're concealed right there, which means they're going to get a bonus to a concealed roll because A, they're distracted, B, they're behind a wall, and C, they're going to get an advantage to their attack roll because they are concealed and they do have cover to hide behind, but yet they can still attack your character. So does that provoke an opportunity of attack? I ask you, does that? Well, sure it does. Absolutely. I mean, if these roles were reversed... And these guys are facing off against him and your characters moved into this area up against the wall now typically and what I'm referencing to is D&D &D with opportunity of attack meaning if a character moves within five feet of you do you get an opportunity of attack or if you are um, already engaged in something else where you are distracted in a monster is able to creep up behind you, it gets an opportunity of attack. Well, the same applies here. And let me ask you this question. If this was your tabletop RPG and you were playing solitaire and you were in this same situation where you now have cover, you're up against a wall, you see these guys distracted by him, would you take the opportunity? Would you be expect an opportunity of attack? Well, sure you would. And terrain helps with that. It really puts this in perspective for you so you can see it and you can focus as a player on those game mechanics to where you're not bogged down. Like, cool, I have an opportunity of attack here. I can use this. Or if you're using 5e, wait a minute, with my current situation here, I'm going to roll my attack roll with advantage. All right, my friends, 
this is how I how I do it right here. This is how I do it. And you know, as I have said in older videos years before, um, I enjoy different aspects of the tabletop RPG hobby, more so than just playing games. I enjoy painting terrain, making terrain. So I have other things that I can implement into my games, depending on the scale, how large I want to make it. If I want to scale it down smaller, 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 and even smaller. I'm able to do that. And like I said, don't take this the wrong way. This is over years of accumulating. And I'm going to give you examples here. This is from Pegasus. This is a, let me see. I think I still have the box that this came out of. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is a project I just recently painted and I had waited till it went on sale and it was really cheap. It was about, it was under 18 bucks when I got this and originally they were asking upwards of 50 bucks for it. And it's this right here. I decided to pick it up and painting it. I'm just about on the last stages of finishing this set and it'll actually be fully painted to what I want for, um, for me, personally. So that's one way. I will look at stuff. I'll wait till stuff goes on sale. I'll try to avoid buying stuff because it's a fad, because that's what everybody else is doing. I look at what is it gonna be practical? How much use am I gonna get out of this? And storage, am I gonna be able to have enough space to actually store this stuff? And how much use will I get out of it? Well. I can tell you right now, with corner walls, if you're using dungeons, if you're using ruins, if you're using any of that, you'll get a lot of use out of these. This came out of a HeroScape set. That's where I originally got these. These are some of the first walls I ever had. This is a 3D printed, bought this off of Amazon from um, Ender Toys, I believe they call themselves, and they make all kinds of terrain um, for the gamer and you just have to paint it. You gotta be a little patient with 3D printed stuff because of it does soak up paint fairly quickly and you have to make several applications and you gotta put a little extra work into it to make it look decent. Same thing with this, same manufacturer that made this. Picked this up off Amazon. And when I bought this, this is when they first released a set and it came with this wall and This wall to complete it. It ran me about 16 bucks. Um, I painted it, flocked it, did all that, add some moss effect into it to make it look more like something that's been sitting out in the wilderness weathering away for centuries. So this right here, which I will use from time to time, Believe it or not, where I found this, and where I'm going to show you next for some of my terrain stuff where I found it. When my daughter was very young and we had taken her to Toys R Us and uh, she was picking out a few things that she wanted. When I was standing in the checkout line, they had a display for a playset. set. They had these little knights and other stuff in it. It was relatively inexpensive. It was like $17 at the time. But I saw this and a few other things I'm gonna show you out of there. And I said, man, I could really, with some paint, make this stuff look really cool. Now this, I didn't do anything with. This was pre-painted and it came out of their set just this way and I was like, hey, that's pretty cool the way that it is. Now in the future, I may touch it up and put some rusting effect here with paint on where you see all the, uh, um, I don't know what they would call those uh, bindings, I guess, to bind the timber together. It really doesn't matter. It's just gonna be for paint effect. I might do that in the future. I might just leave it as is. So to give you an idea of 3D terrain, not all of it has to be um, brand name, officially licensed RPG game stuff. This right here 
I had found a old board game at a yard sale and it was based off of chess and it was like this it was all 100% strategy if you really enjoyed chess this was a supposed to be a game that was supposed to be way better well I couldn't find anybody that wanted to play it with me and I wound up selling it in a yard sale except for missing one thing when I went through your starting pieces started out here and these little walls kind of looks familiar doesn't it and I said you know what it'll have all the pieces minus this it is a yard sale after all so you can't expect great things from um, when you buy them secondhand used. I know some people will be thinking that's rotten, but you know what? It looks great on the game table, though, doesn't it? When I get into more so of this, this is actually my bread and butter of my scatter terrain and uh, just stuff I have accumulated for my tabletop RPGs over the years. A lot of this stuff that's in here, believe it or not, I mean some of the stuff's a little bit more added recent add-ons. I bought these condition markers, particularly I use for board games when I play my solitaire dungeon crawler board games, stuff like that. Some of this stuff is officially licensed WizKid stuff, like the cemetery set. Yeah, I paid a little bit of money for that, but it was cool. I really did, <laughs> really did like that. I used it quite a bit when I first got it, but then it just kind of, this is why I express about when it comes to terrain, don't break yourself on this stuff. Think outside the box. Think about some things. I'm going to show you some examples of how you can take some very cool things and with a little bit of paint and technique you can make really cool stuff out of it for really really cheap okay remember this i showed you this out of that same place that is where i got these this is the original color what they were like i had just painted these and put that effect in there made a green wash to make it look like it has mold growing in between the bricks stuff like that and then when i was done i had taken um a layer several layers actually of mod podge and put it over that to protect the paint so it wouldn't peel off and it would be durable and when i was done with the gaming session i could just do that throw it back in there and i'm not going to have to worry about it getting damaged same thing with the pillars pillars came out of the same set i like the way that they are how it's got that old marbled type of texture to them now i thought what i should do is go back in with a paint wash and fill up all the cracks and really make the cracks pop out i might do that i might just leave them as is because realistically when you put this on a game table it's just representing a pillar in the room it's just really representing more to block line of sight stuff like that so um it's one of those things that's on the bottom of my to-do list, I should say. Mage Knight. So some of you are familiar with uh, the Mage Knight board game that may enjoy it. Mage Knight started out as a miniature game. And this is one of... Uh, I had picked this up at a hobby store years and years ago. And it was a basically a booster, a terrain booster pack. And it came with a couple of ponds and a few other things in it. But I was like, that's really cool. And then I discontinued that version of Mage Knight. And as you can see on the back, um, it still has all of the necessary information you need to know. Uh, I think this light's gonna... There we go. Let me get that light out of your way. So you can see it's got all this necessary information printed on the back that you need to know to play the game. So... You know, and this is what I'm talking about. I have accumulated these over the years. This isn't something that I just went out and said, hey, guess what? I want some terrain. I'm just going to dump a whole lot of money into terrain. No, absolutely not. This, this has been a slow, steady buildup over the years. Many years. I'm probably getting close to 18, 18, 19 years worth of um, mini terrain build up here but i'm going to show you some other sources this this was actually part of a mcdonald's toy 
that my daughter got when she was really young. And as she got older and she was cleaning out her stuff, she was going to throw it away. And she says, do you want it? And I said, yeah, huh, the little bit of paint, I can do something really cool with that. So I made a crate, works really well, especially when you're playing in the dungeon setting and your characters walk into a room and they see a large crate in there. Kind of really stands out and it's a lot better than a cardboard um, rendition of a crate that you get. Same thing with these. That's where these came from. These were actually out of a toy she got from McDonald's. It was like a little playset thing that she got. I don't, I don't really remember where it came from. All I do know is these were heading for the scrap bin. And uh, I had said, yeah, you know, dad will take those and I'll do something cool with them. Sat down, primered them all black because they were purple. And then went back through and using some brush technique was able to make them look like sandbags. So as you can see, not everything in here is really top of the line, um, you know, miniature. I think what uh, I'm going to say, you're going to find game snobs, as I like to refer to them, the people who have to have the best of the best of the best of the best. You're not going to find that, and you really don't need it. All you need is a little bit of creativity, and you can make some really cool stuff come together. Okay, so here is another one that was a contribution from my daughter. Uh, don't know where she got this, but this was out of a playset. She was going to throw away. I haven't finished painting this one in yet, and eventually I will. Um, I'm going to put more effects to it. It's just been, like I said, it's... With everything else I've had going on lately, it's kind of low on my priority list. Now, here's another one. This, believe it or not, I had subscribed to Dungeon Crate, and I had used uh, Dungeon Crate, and I got like three boxes, and by the third box, I only got a couple of cool things out of it. I got like one cool mini, an owl bear. I got this, as they put in there, as a token, and everything else was pretty much just crap, to say the least. I mean, I am a, uh, you know, I enjoy gaming, and I get it. The Dungeon Crate is put together for a wide range of age levels, but really, what use do I have with stickers and if i'm paying a monthly subscription fee i expect to get cool gaming stuff that i can use practically for gaming and this really does absolutely nothing for me now some people could suggest well you could put it on a map you could take something like this and show the area of the map and put the sticker on it um yeah no i'm not going to destroy my map with a cheap sticker so, anyways, just wanted to show you. I took that. It, they just sent me this. I took the base. I got some blank bases for actually basing miniatures and glued it to it, and it works fairly well. Just, boom, put it out there. You know, your characters, they set up camp. They're out in the middle of the wilderness. Boom, 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 boom. Bam. Right there. Got a great representation of it. You can see everything. Everything is scaled and it doesn't take a whole lot of time. So I think I have talked your ear off enough. I'm going to show you one more example of how you can actually, um, you don't have to buy anything you can make stuff yourself and these right here okay believe it or not you can take a look at that really it's cardboard that's all it is this is an old toilet paper roll that has been glued to this base that i had cut out and made um using mod podge and paper towel i had soaked it and formed the root system 
using hot glue. I just went in there and streaked it to give it uh, texture for the bark. And then a little bit of flocking here. Painted, went through, dry brushed and all that. Everything I do for, mini you know, making miniatures. Like I said, there's more to the hobby I enjoy. And instead of just playing role-playing games all the time, I do other things with um, terrain as well. This is one of them. Protected it with Maj Podge. I mean, it's just very with the with the glue and the Maj Podge. They're very durable. They can. I'm, they've been bounced around several times. Throw them into the corner, whatever else. Pull them out, and it costs me nothing but time. Literally time and a little bit of paint. Uh, same thing here as well. So when it comes to terrain, don't feel as if uh, your back is against a wall and you have to buy huge expensive sets that are going to just break the bank for your gaming table. You don't. You absolutely don't. As a matter of fact, when it comes to acquiring terrain and building up your terrain, just be smart about it. I mean, when you see something that catches your eye that's like, hey, that's really cool, but it's not the color you like, remember, you can always find paint. You can always change it to what you want to fit your game table. And this is where I'm going to leave this video off and continue on this has been kind of a long uh, video but we covered a lot I've given you a lot of examples to think about why with solitaire gaming having a good 3d representation in front of you on the game table in my opinion in the way that i play is important because it really does help answer a lot of them questions and you can actually see, and it gives you the chance at that point to utilize your character's combat proficiencies or skills or feats or whatever system you're working, you can have a good visual representation, solitaire, rather than trying to do it all in your mind and trying to balance everything else as well. And that's a, you know, that's a huge chore. And like I said, I will re-emphasize this. If you are happy doing that, keep doing that. Game on, man. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're feeling you're a bit taxed, it's a bit too much, it's a bit confusing, you need some clarification, try a 3D representation. You don't have to break the bank using cheap stuff like this creating your own, uh, you know, that's all you need. You can use paper, create your own, dice you can move about the board, you can get a little bit more elaborate like I do, and you can actually use 3D terrain and actually set stuff out there to be able to give you more depth and more um, eye candy, so to speak, for your game. All right, my friends, this is where I'm going to leave this off, and we're going to move into um, another uh, area of solitaire play, and then I'm going to get into session one of my game system and show you how this is all done and how it all comes together. All right, my friends, until next time, this is Artichoke Dip, signing off.